Hello and welcome to another episode of Word Search with me, Christopher Dryden. Uh, we're on episode two of our series and I'll let you know what that series is all about momentarily. It's a pleasure to have this time with you though. Thank you so much for investing it in this particular venture on this day. So what Word Search is doing today, I'll give you an update on what Word Search is obviously and then you'll find out what's been going on previously on word search before we get into the meat of the matter and the meat of the matter today is the continuation of our series on the four m's what it is to be in form and uh, we're looking at that through the prism of an interesting episode in the life of god's people uh, found in the book of acts chapter three and four today uh, we're looking at part two in particular the encounter that we discover in the first part of acts chapter three now we'll be looking at that carefully, including the exploration of the content itself, discovering what concepts underpin that content and what conclusions we can reach from that that can apply to our lives today. Before leaving you with some prayer points to consider and ask God to help you out with, as well as to help us out with, as we desire to do what is pleasing in the sight of God himself. Okay, so what is word search? Word search is a place to search God's word, but it's also a time where we are looking for God's word to search us, to examine us. So it's not just about us looking into it and reading it and having a good time and whatever in that sense. It's also about what does the word have to say to us and what is it telling us about us? And as it does so, we're looking to encourage godly character development. We want to grow to become more like Christ every day and God's word is crucial to that effort. In doing so, it's not just about the character, though. It's also about what we conduct ourselves in doing. So it's a character in conduct. And that's all about stimulating kingdom seeking that informs and transforms our prayer and our practice. And what that means is, as we examine God's word, as we search it carefully, uh, the desire is that we will know more about who God is and God can inform us more about who we are in the light of him in pursuit of his kingdom and his righteousness so that our prayers and practice can be informed by his word and when necessary transformed by his word as we endeavor to go from one degree of glory to another. That's what word search is and what we've been and what we started of late is to discover that word search is to find the treasure in God's word so that we can be hearers and doers of the word we discovered that the more we treasure something is the more that we will place emphasis place our thinking uh, place all of our efforts into whatever it is and the more we do that and then the more we act on that so that we're not just hearers of the word but we're doers also so what we've covered previously in our time together in the first part of this particular series uh, i had an overview uh, of first of all reading Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4, um, founding that on the conviction that I have that every follower, every disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ needs to recognize who they are as a member of the family of God, a minister of the Lord Jesus, a messenger of the good news, as well as a missionary of the kingdom of God. Uh, as I said, I read over Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4, and took great pleasure in reading it, but I encourage you to read it yourself. And I gave an overview of what we're hoping to explore in that area, in those seven parts that we're hoping to cover today, where it comes to exploring uh, the mission, the message, the ministers and the members in that area. And then I also gave a bit of a contextual overview as to what's led us to this particular point, seeing as though as ever, if you know what's led you to this point, then it can inform you as to what's going on. If you want to find out more information about that, I'm sure on whatever platform you're listening or watching this to, there should be the previous part available. And I encourage you to have a listen or a watch of that. Uh, I hope you will find a blessing and encouragement and a building up of your faith in the Lord. All of that to say, where we find ourselves now is having established all of that, we're going to explore together carefully what's going on in the first element of Acts chapter Three. We're particularly going to explore what's going on in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 11, which I've entitled The Encounter. So let's have a look at the Word of God together and see what God's Word is saying in 
the book of Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. It says as follows. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. Dear God, please give us a blessing, even in the hearing and the reading of your word, so that it can make a difference to our lives, understanding that even in the understanding of what you have to say here, God, that something can happen to us, so that we can rejoice and celebrate who you reveal yourself to be in your son, Jesus Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Please do that for us, Lord, as we investigate your word for your name's sake. Right, so let's consider the Let's consider what's going on in this chapter uh, carefully. What I, find, what I find really fascinating about what's going on in this section of scripture is, uh, first of all, let's look at this bit where uh, the word declares that Peter directed his gaze at him, as in the man that's blame at the gate, as did John. And what I find fascinating about this episode, first of all, the guy who's at the gate is there regularly. It's a daily routine for him. And Peter and John going up to the temple at the ninth hour, we can imagine likewise, it's not unusual for them to do that. So it's interesting to see how regularly Peter and John might have passed him. All that matters is on this occasion, they pass him. He he looks to them, but they engage with him. There's something really fascinating about engaging with the situation that you see. And Engaging with that situation with the eyes of the spirit, as in God gives you an idea that now is the time to engage in a situation. You might be passing something on a regular basis, but there's something about one moment where the spirit of God really connects with you to say, now it's time to engage. And this is something about the mission of God that I think is very important for us as believers to recognize. And it's something that I need to be constantly reminded about as well, is that When we're reading about these episodes in scripture, sure, they are descriptive rather than prescriptive. Sure, there is an element in which Luke is just highlighting what's gone on in the lives of God's people. But there is also an element in which we have to see that if this is how God has used his people in the past, there's no reason why God can't use his people today in a similar way, being relevant to engage with the situation that's going on. So that's the first part that I found fascinating. It was Peter and John, they were together. It wasn't just Peter, Peter and John, and they engage with the situation that's presented to them. Now, it's one thing to endeavor to engage with someone. It's also good to see if there's some degree of reciprocation. It's um, it's, it's one thing to pray about a situation, if you get me. So you might pray about that neighbor down the street or about your friend, in the workplace or whatever. It's one thing to pray about them, but it's another thing to engage with them and to see that engagement 
reciprocated. God has made us to be relationship beings. And in this case, it's just fascinating to see that there's a reciprocation. So the man was looking to Peter and John. Then Peter and John looked at them and said, look at us. And, and the man looked at them expecting something. There's a degree of uh, relationship taking place. Listen, saints, don't underestimate the power of engagement. Don't underestimate the power of two people interacting and sharing a moment together because you never know what God's spirit might do through you in the name of Jesus as you endeavor to engage both with God in terms of the mission that he has and then with the people who are the recipients of that mission. So that, that bit is fascinating as well. And then we come to one of the favorite phrases that I hear um, God's people speak about in terms of what, it's one of my favorites anyway, in terms of what Peter says to this man and what he offers to this man. And I just love the fact that Peter is saying, look, I don't have money. Uh, I don't have what you're looking for, but I do have something that you need. Um, and in our day and age, it's, it's a comfort to know that our walk with Jesus means we already have something that people need. We already have something that people need. We are already filled with the life of someone that we know that people need. Fellow believers as well, you know, so even as we interact with other believers, you know, we may not have the money or the skills or the abilities, but we do have something that they need. And we can talk into people's situation as we offer them uh, something that can make the difference in their life. So it's just fascinating to see Peter again uh, addressing this man and looking at this man uh, and saying that, listen, I don't have what you what you're looking for, but I do have what you need. and it, it's a challenge for us in our day to consider carefully, isn't it? Are we offering people what they want or are we offering people what we know they need? I'll leave that with you. I, I, I won't go any further into that. We're just still looking at the content of things. And so once the man accepts the offer that's, that's given to him, uh, and then we have the outcome and the response from the man. So there's the offer and then there's the response from the man. And we see that it's the power of God that gives this man the ability to walk and not just walk, but able to leap and jump and praise God. Um, and, and this bit is fascinating as well in terms of the response of the man, because just because you got a miracle from God, it doesn't necessarily mean that your response will be, that's great. Let me now go into the house of God to praise God about what he's done for me. If you get where I'm coming from. Some of us receive miracles, and what's the first thing that we do? We go, phew, thank God for that, and move on, as though, um, as though, as long as my need is met, that's all that matters. Whereas this man, in response to what God has done to him, he's, uh, he's really celebrating the miracle. He's really celebrating the power of God in his life. And it should remind us, as believers, as those who endeavor to walk with Jesus, again, how we should react, because we can find ourselves in a very similar situation to this man in terms of when Jesus came to us. Or what Were we able? Um, were we physically able? Were we even alive? And then look what Jesus has done for us. And um, look at the response that we should have to that tremendous miracle in that while we were dead, Christ made us alive. While we were poor, Christ enriched us. While we were crippled, Christ gave us the power to walk again. And so in the light of that, it should lead us to uh, that kind of joyful expression of who God is. Fascinating element of that area I found there. So that's his response to it. But then there's also the response of those that have seen him and have recognized him. So there's that kind of the effect that it has on the audience. Um, and that's, that's the beautiful thing about the mission of God. The mission of God takes place in people's regular lives and people's regular lives that is witnessed by others. So they, they have an idea of what the norm is. So that the norm is that the children are supposed to have behavioral issues. They're supposed to have mental health issues. The norm is that um, you're supposed to stay out of work because finding work is difficult. The norm is that once you're diagnosed with a particular illness, that's just the way things are. And we just have to cope with it. That's the norm. Whereas the mission of God makes a difference, not just to you, but to those who have witnessed the norm around you. And I find that particularly fascinating in terms of the fact that the people recognized him. And as a result of the change of the norm, even they have seen something that 
makes them think differently and, and fills them with what? Wonder and amazement about what's happened to him. So that's what's taking place here. Uh, so, so take ever again, just the content of what's happened here. Here is a man in a particular situation. Here's Peter and John engaging with him. Here he is reciprocating that engagement. And then they have something for him that he needs. And he receives what is needed and he receives the power and it has effect on him. And it has an effect on those uh, around them. And it's, and it's a powerful and an amazing insight into how the mission of God operates. As I hold up my hand and say again, yeah, this is descriptive. It's not necessarily prescriptive, but it gives us an insight in terms of how the mission of God uh, takes place, how we engage in the everyday circumstances that people see as the norm uh, and how the power of God can work through people by the name of Jesus to really make a difference as we give people not what they want, but what they need. So let's dig further into what we're witnessing in terms of some of the concepts that I think are there in what we've read. And the first thing uh, to know is about the mission of God. So the mission of God means a lot to me. And it, thankfully, it means a lot more to God. And it's just about where can we see a kingdom opportunity to show the rule of God? Where can we see it? In this case, Peter and John saw a kingdom opportunity to demonstrate the rule of God through addressing the need of a man who was clearly lame, wasn't able to move. And so they saw that there was a kingdom opportunity there. Now, you should ask the question, well, how did they come about having that kind of mentality? And what we'll discover later on, and it's not a spoiler to say it here, that what we discover later on is that they saw that because Peter and John had spent time with Jesus. So they knew who Jesus was. They'd walked with Jesus for the best part of three and a half years, and they had seen him on a mission. They had noted carefully what it was to be on mission because they saw Jesus on a mission. So they had been with him, they had seen him, they'd observed him, and from time to time they were even equipped and empowered to be on the same mission in terms of the proclamation and demonstration of the rule of God. But more than that, it was more than being with him, observing him, and getting a taster from it. They recognized as well that they were called to carry on the mission. So having seen how Jesus operated on the mission, they recognized that they had been appointed to likewise be on the mission. And as I shared uh, last week in terms of the larger context, there's the element in which having been risen from the dead and spent time with his disciples, teaching them about the kingdom of God, the uh, moment on the day of Pentecost where they're filled with the Holy Spirit and able to use the opportunity to proclaim the good news to that audience, that was the kind of the fire starter to what God wanted to do through those who he had called to be on the same mission, demonstrating and declaring the kingdom of God so that people can see what it looks like, hear what it's all about, as we'll discover later on, and then make the necessary response. So underlying concepts of what we're seeing here in this episode is how two men who had been with Jesus and seen Jesus on a mission carried on that mission. And they were only able to carry on that mission because they were empowered by the spirit of God to operate just like him. So when we consider those underlying concepts, um, there really is no reason for us to see Peter and John as particularly supreme or superior to us there's no need for us to see that because they had spent time with Jesus and those of us who follow Jesus are invited to spend time with Jesus they had seen Jesus on a mission those of us who follow Jesus now we understand or we should understand that Jesus is still on a mission through his people the desire to reach out to people with the proclamation and demonstration of his kingdom and in the same way then as we follow Jesus and are filled with the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, we are likewise empowered by the spirit to be on mission. And it's, um, it's really important that we all discover that we play a role in that, all of us. Uh, we don't necessarily all have the responsibility to heal, uh, but we're all on a mission to see healing take place in the name of Jesus. We're not necessarily all having the responsibility to um, do everything that we see in scripture, but we all must recognize 
um, the importance of the mission and our role in the mission and how crucial our role is on the mission. So those are some of the underlying concepts that I see in this particular area of the encounter and how the encounter reveals uh, the mission of God. So in the light of that, what conclusions can we reach about what we're reading in this particular section? The first encounter, the first conclusion that I would encourage us to consider carefully at this time is, do we recognize the call to be on mission? I was challenged recently about what gospel did I receive? And I was challenged about it because I recognize that some of us have received the gospel and that, that wants to reassure us that we're safe and that things are all right and we can just keep things the way that they are. However, I'm more and more convinced that that's not the, that's not the extension of the good news that was given to us. The extension of the good news is actually about a man who was on a mission to establish right relationships with God and right relationships with God that would also see the right rule of God return where it should be. That's a big mission. And so in the same way that he rescues people out of darkness into light, now that we are people of light, we're on the same mission. But do we recognize the call to be on mission with God? Do we recognize that? And do we sense what that mission is where we are? So in your workplace, in your home, in your community, in your relationships, in your activities in life, do you sense what the mission is? Uh, Peter and John were clearly having an awareness of what the kingdom of God is when they saw this man. Bearing in mind again, this isn't the first time that they've seen the man, but they just noticed that this is a kingdom opportunity. And on that occasion, they recognize it's time to engage in seeing the kingdom of God being expressed. Do we understand what the mission looks like where we are? It may not necessarily be about looking for the instantaneous results that Peter and John uh, experience, but it is about our intention to engage with whatever it is, whether it's in our relationship with our family, in our interaction in the community, in our connections, in the workplace, whatever it is, do we sense what that mission is? where we are and as a result are we sensitive to kingdom opportunities uh, if you're interested in finding out more about kingdom opportunities by the way there is a series of teachings that i know uh, are, are available and so please use the contact details in the information below or wherever you're engaging with this uh, material and find out more about kingdom opportunities because the book of acts is just full of kingdom opportunities and so many lessons that we can learn in terms of how we can be sensitive to kingdom opportunities. Um, sometimes your life is so wrapped up in the immediacy of your needs for food and for drink and for clothing and such like that you actually forget that Jesus said all of those things are sorted uh, when you are following him. And as a result, when you're following him, rather than prioritizing those things, your priority should be more about kingdom opportunities. How can I pursue his kingdom and his righteousness first? And that, hopefully, will generate and cultivate a sense of being sensitive to kingdom opportunities. And it's not for us to beat ourselves over the head if we haven't. Um, we have a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and it's by his grace that we have that relationship. And his spirit then is for us, and he lives in us, and he's filling us with his power, his wisdom, and his sensitivity to discern those kingdom opportunities. Um, I love knocking about with certain people who are led by the spirit to engage and interact with people and speak a word into a situation or bring about change in the situation through action and an act of kindness, an act of service. It's just brilliant to knock around with those people because it reinforces the understanding that what we're reading here wasn't just meant for Peter and John. It was meant for believers and followers who recognized that as disciples of Jesus, they are members of the family of God. They are ministers of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are messengers of the gospel and they are on mission with God to see kingdom difference as the spirit of God gives them the wisdom, power and sensitivity to do so. Something else that's big to take away from this particular episode that I don't want anyone to overlook at all 
what you're doing and what we're endeavoring to do in terms of being sensitive to kingdom opportunities, we are not obliged to do on our own. We have a personal responsibility in terms of our relationship with God. Yes, we will be held accountable for our personal responsibility, for our personal relationship with God, for sure. Uh, but there's no need for us to feel under pressure to say that we have to do this work on our own. It wasn't Peter who was uh, conducting what was happening. It was Peter and John together. And there was that sense from the patterns all the way going back into the Old Testament times. But there's always this principle of it, it's better to do it in twos. Uh, you're better off with two than on your own. And Jesus kept that principle going and when you read the rest of Acts, you'll you'll be aware of that. It's twos and it's groups of people together on, on mission together. So you don't have to be on this mission on, on your own. There are those that God has called into your life that you can work with and share life with and then look for kingdom opportunities. And the way that God can work between the two of you or between the group of you can make such a difference in terms of expressing the power of God so that people are aware it's not the individual that's done it. It's really the power of God that's worked through relationships. So another big conclusion to take away from our reading today is to continue to trust God for kingdom expressions that leaves a mark. Uh, Peter and John, as I said, they might have passed that guy so often, but on that occasion, as led by the Spirit of God, by giving the man what he needed rather than what he wanted, they had a kingdom expression. They had an opportunity to establish a kingdom expression that left a mark. It left an impact. And so we likewise today in following Jesus, in pursuing his kingdom, in being all that he's called to be, we can leave a kingdom expression that has such an impact that people can, they can say what they like, but they cannot deny uh, that the power of God has been demonstrated as we've endeavored to be faithful to his kingdom and to his righteousness. So in the light of all of that, I have some prayer points that I want us to consider at this time in the light of all that we've considered. I want us to continue to acknowledge that the God that we serve is a God on a mission and that we are on the mission with him. So that's the first prayer point, acknowledge God and the mission that he's on. The second prayer point is to recognize the mission. So as we acknowledge that God is on a mission, it's our desire to recognize what that mission looks like in our day and time. And as I've noted, in terms of we don't have to do this on our own, let's also seek the Lord for who are those mission partners that he's connected us with. You might know who they are already. You might be working with them already. And so if, if that's the case, thank God for that. And may God strengthen those partnerships and those connections as you go and as you grow. But even if you are aware of who your mission partners are, pray for others so that all believers can be aware of those partnerships that God has given us so that we can do kingdom business together. Pray that we would connect with those mission partners. That's the third prayer point. And then the fourth prayer point I want you to consider carefully is that we would maximize those mission opportunities. Let's ask the Spirit of God once more to fill us with that boldness and that ability to really notice what the opportunity is, act on it, and make the most of it as we do so. Never, never refraining and never stretching back from the beauty of what it is to see the rule of God in action, restoring right relationships, bringing healing where it's necessary, correcting people where it's necessary, and seeing God glorified in the process. Let's never lessen those opportunities and dim those, but let's see what we can do to make the most of it. And then finally, uh, the final prayer point, after you've acknowledged that God is on a mission, after you've recognized what the mission is in your particular area, and as you connect with the mission partners that God has given you and maximize those mission opportunities, the final prayer point I want you to consider is to celebrate the mission accomplished. Uh, the reality is this, uh, Jesus has overcome the world. The reality is that Jesus died and he rose triumphantly from the grave. And the reality is, in the light of that, that we are assured his promised return to establish his eternal kingdom forever. So what we're doing now 
is, is an indication and a pointer to what is about to happen based on what has happened. And it's worth us celebrating uh, those areas where we see the mission accomplished, where we see people's lives changed, where we see disciples made, where we see righteousness revealed and revered. Uh, it's, it's, it's important that we celebrate that. And please don't minimize and uh, make, make trivial wherever you see it take place, because it's a big deal to God for his kingdom to be established through our obedience to him as he leads us to make the most of kingdom opportunities. Uh, it's my contention again, saints, that kingdom people apply kingdom practices in kingdom pursuits for kingdom purposes. And so as you bear those prayer points in mind, I'm hoping that you will not just pray to God for them, but also be available to hear God's response as they take place. Thank you then for your time in engaging with uh, the Word Search episode today. In our next episode on the Word Search with me, Christopher Dryden, what I'm hoping that we will explore is episode three, where we look at the message. So we've looked at the encounter, which is a revelation of the mission, and we're going to begin to look at the message in our first part of our two-parter, considering the message as Peter opens his mouth and he's about to speak. Until then, uh, thank you so much. And please remember, wherever you've engaged with this particular session, to like and to share and to subscribe onto the channel that you're on so that you can get more of this content that you're able to utilize and, and make a difference in your world. And while you're liking, sharing and subscribing in any way that you can support what we're doing here, however the Lord leads you to support that, uh, the best way that you can support that to me it's just to apply the things that you're learning in the light of the scripture. So as ever, don't take my word for it. The whole point of word search is that you would search the word for yourself and apply so that you can become everything that God has called you to become. And doing all of this with the spirit of thanksgiving. Thank you for your time. And thank you so much for your effort. Uh, thank you so much for your obedience to God in your life where you're at. Remembering that here on Word Search, we're here to find treasure in God's word, so that we can be hearers and doers of the word. God continue to bless you richly as you do what he calls you to do for his namesake. Shalom. <laughs>